Good day, and uh, good to be here with you once again. And um, thank you for allowing me in your places and wherever you're watching or listening or both. Uh, I want to start by, uh, before we get into the message, uh, I want to start by uh, just asking if you would be okay to uh, pray for my wife and I and our family as the last couple of weeks have been uh, rough patches. My wife has been dealing with some some medical issues, uh, put it that way, and uh, so that'd be great if you could remember to do that. We would appreciate that and be great, very grateful for you, for that as well. Well, today we're going to continue along in our sermon series, uh, um, A Living Hope, uh, our time and study in First Peter. And uh, so that's where we're going to be at. So you can turn in your Bibles to First Peter. And uh, we'll be uh, looking at verses uh, probably 13 through 16 today, focusing on that. So from 1984 to 1995, 11 years, American television was the home of the syndicated series, Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. Us older folks might remember seeing some of those episodes. And for 10 years, the show was hosted by British-born Robin Leach. Then in 1994, Leach would co-host along Sherry Belafonte. And the series was one of the first shows to highlight the lives of the wealthy up and close. Audiences were invited into the luxurious residences and the lifestyles of those that were profiled. So across the world, Leach via camera would invite viewers into grandiose villas, opulent mansions, and yachts. Now, when we consider for a moment, just briefly, the lives of the rich and famous, I think it would behoove us to not judge too harshly. And you might ask why. Well, first, uh, we don't really know their thoughts, their desires, their hopes, their very soul. Maybe those who are close to them might have an insight into their character and their thoughts and desires and all that stuff. And again, maybe not. You might say, Pastor, uh, can we not tell something by the lavish lifestyles, the fame and the riches? And I would just say, maybe, maybe, and maybe not. However, you and I know that God knows. King David prayed this prayer, O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You discern my thoughts from afar. Psalm 139, verse 1 and 2. And the point is this. When we look here at the Apostle Peter's letter, we find that he addressed the believers' hopes and desires. And the hopes and desires which are located internally in a person. That is located in the soul. The place where a person's desires and thoughts reside. The home of the conscience. The, the conscience knowing right from wrong. So the question is this. For today, how is a believer to live in the world? How are believers to live the God-centered life? So please turn your Bibles, as I mentioned, to 1 Peter chapter 1. Uh, we're going to read uh, verse 13 through 16. I hope you have a chance to read that whole chapter, at the very least, to give you the context. Uh, verse 13 to 16, 1 Peter chapter 1. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray together. Father, I thank you uh, for your word. I thank you for this time together. Thank you that we can ask people to help us in our lives by, by praying for us. Thank you that we pray for others. Uh, what a gift of grace you've given us. And as we ponder today, 1 uh, Peter chapter 1, verse 13 to 16, help us, O Holy Spirit, to understand uh, the ramifications not only for the day it was written, but for the uh, context of our own day as well. And we thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy that you uh, provide for us and give to us uh, from your loving and merciful hand, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we, we're going to set our attention today on verse 13 to 16. Let's read 
of that one more time together. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children do, not, children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. And finally, verse 16, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Please notice with me that this text, beginning here at verse 13, starts with a conjunction. Uh, translated in the ESV, therefore. Now, in case we've forgotten, a conjunction is designed to link words and phrases and clauses and sentences. So the therefore, here in verse 13, does this very thing by pointing back to the Apostle Peter's exhortation from verse 1 to 12, which we actually bring with us into this text. And as we survey those first 12 verses of Peter's letter, we find the Apostle's emphasis was on the believer's hope of salvation. The Apostle Peter's audience that he puts down here as elect exiles, uh, dealing with various trials we find in verse 6 there, they possessed a living hope. This is the title of our sermon series. It was a living hope that they had committed themselves by faith, according to what Peter said here, and I probably said Paul once too many, Peter said the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's in verse 3. And my friends, this hope that they possessed was not some imaginary hope, a wishful kind of hope. Uh, this was not hope in hope. The believer's living hope is founded on a historical event. What historical event? Verse 3, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So, friends, we can say that believers, a believer's faith is tied to the reality of the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. We can be put it another way. The believer's hope and faith are placed in a person, God the Son, second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, who according to the Apostle Peter here at verse 20, would say was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last time for the sake of you. Here, without a doubt, we see the deity of Jesus Christ. For those uh, people out there that think he was not God, well, this verse nails that out the door. Anyways, I digress. And this was a faith, when we think about the faith, a faith that God has given us, it is the gift of, of grace from God the Father because it is through him, that is Christ, that the apostles' audience and every believer since, that includes you and me, are believers in God. And why? So that your faith and hope are in God. Verse 21. And friends, all of it, every bit of it, the work of a merciful God in a person. And friends, not, none, not one little bit, the work of a person. Not your work or my work. I like the way C.S. Lewis puts his angle on this whole idea here, or this truth, I mean. He said, the question is not what we intended ourselves to be, but what God intended us to be when he made us. So the believer's hope of salvation is a result of the merciful God who sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to redeem a people to himself through Christ's sinless life, death, and resurrection. A salvation that the apostle Peter said will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That is when Jesus returns. The apostle here in verse 13b, repeating what he had previously stated twice in the first 12 verses concerning a believer's faith and hope and salvation. For example, in verse 5, Peter said, for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And then in verse 7, at the revelation of Jesus Christ. All three of these verses speaking of Jesus' second coming. So the language obviously here is pointing to a future historical event yet to happen. Friends, what God had planned in eternity past through his Son will one day be fully realized when Jesus Christ returns for the second time. And so from the first century through all the age, believers are reminded by the word of God and the ordinances of the church, communion and baptism, that we are to live every day of our lives, every day of our lives holding together God's promise in eternity past alongside with his promise of the day when Jesus returns and this brings us back to that question of the day that we started with. 
how are believers to live a God-centered life in the world today as they anticipate, as you and I anticipate, the return of Jesus Christ. Well, let's see what the Apostle Peter said to address this question for his audience over 2,000 years ago. He said here in verse 13, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Please notice with me the phrase, preparing your minds for action. If you use the New King James Version, uh, the New King James Version translates the Greek as, grid up the loins of your mind. Grid up the loins of your mind. Of course, a believer is to set their hope toward the future expectation of the return of, G of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As it was already mentioned, this hope is a sure hope. However, in the meantime, there is a life to be lived today. Today is a life to be lived. Or today, there's a life to be lived. And Peter exhorted believers to prepare your minds for action. This Greek verb that is translated in the ESV uh, prepare or in the NI, or New King James Version grid carries a sense to put on clothes, to, to dress. So Peter's audience uh, would have understood because maybe... Certainly in our context, we would not understand this grid. Peter's audience would have understood Peter's reference here. In the first century, when we think about the first century, folks would wear long uh, robe-like clothing. And if they wanted to walk or run quickly, they had a problem. They would need to gather up their loose robes with a belt so they could, would not trip and fall as they moved. We think of the, prodigal, the story of the prodigal son, when the father saw a son returning, the prodigal son. What do we see in that story? He ran, he lifted up his robes and he ran. So what was Peter saying here? Well, a believer, like you and me, in their daily lives must pull their thoughts together. In other words, believers are to have a disciplined mind. We go to the Apostle Paul's letter to Timothy, the first one and he charged Timothy in that letter to preach the word in season and out of season, to rebuke and reprove. Why? Why did he say that? Well, Paul would go on to say the reason why. Paul said, For a time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own uh, passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. That's in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 to 4, that, that context. You know, friends, as true as this was in the first century, as false teachers would come into the church, this is true in the 21st century church as well. Paul would go on to say to Timothy right after, in that particular part of the letter to him, as for you, always be sober-minded, enduring suffering, do the work of the evangelist, Fulfill your ministry. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5. Back to our text, verse 13. We have the same Greek word translated here, sober-minded. You see it in the text there if you look at it. This can also be, this word, this Greek word can also be translated self-control. And what's happening here is this, is this particular word, sober-minded, this is expressing the same idea as preparing your minds for action. As one commentator paraphrased this particular part of the text, they said, quote, be alert and ready in your whole spiritual and mental attitude because it is easy to slide, especially when you are suffering. We remember that Peter highlighted in his letter here in the very first 12 verses that the elect exiles, that's what he calls them, had been struggling with various trials. Various trials. And when we ponder the days that we struggle and experience various trials, whether the trials of physical nature like uh, my wife is going through right now, or financial, or relational, or even persecution for our faith in Christ as we obey the commandments, the moral commandments of God. And it's in the suffering, the trial of persecution, can they become very difficult for you and me to pull our thoughts together become very emotional, very difficult to do that. 
the predisposition of our minds and these kinds of circumstances are often, uh, often lead us to exaggerations or even denials or questions and when our emotions come at us like a roller coaster, the ups are way up, the downs are way down. And I'm having a hard time flipping this page. The Apostle Peter and Paul, this, and Paul in the text we have examined exhort us to set our hope on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We just set our hope on the hope of salvation, on the hope that Jesus will keep his promise and return one day. And of course, on the road of life, we will encounter ditches, and sometimes we'll go into those ditches. And we see here in this wonderful letter that Peter wrote, his pastoral heart when he said this, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty <clears throat> hand of God, so that you're... So, oh, sorry, let me say that again. I, I missed. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, Strengthen and establish you. First Peter chapter five verse six to eleven. What a wonderful piece of scripture! What a what a wonderful encouragement to these early Christians that were struggling with a variety of trials, our various trials. What a wonderful uh, uh, hope that we have, you and I, in our trials and tribulations, and even even when we are persecuted for our faith and trust in Christ. You see, friends, as believers, we have the long view in this journey called life. We have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. God is the one who has done this. God is the one who keeps on doing it. And God will save us at the coming of his son, Jesus Christ. Glory to God. And so the question is this, do we really believe God? Do we believe God? Well, friends, our assurance is, as the Apostle Peter said, a living hope. Our faith and trust in God makes, must make some difference in the way we live our lives today. You know, we live in those two times. The time before eternity past and the time to come, eternity future. But we live in a real world and real lives and this faith and trust in this great salvation, this living hope, must make some difference in the way we live our lives today. Let's go back to the text. The Apostle Peter described to his audience the difference in the way they should live as elect exiles. Sojourners, he said, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Verse 14. So what is the difference? as obedient children. Now, if you think about that, that's somewhat countercultural. That statement that Peter says here in our context is countercultural because obedience is often very unwelcome in our culture or misunderstood or misapplied and even abused. Now, having said this, the question we should ask Peter is, what do you mean by obedience? Does the apostle mean that we obey rules? Does the apostle mean that we make sure our checklist is all ticked off and in order? Is the apostle, is the apostle concerned, concerned primarily with our outward behavior? Looking good, maybe dressing a certain way, hanging out with certain people. What do you mean, apostle Peter? Well, the apostle Paul, as we turn to him now, is helpful with his exhortation, his letter, in other words, to the Philippian church where Paul said, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. You now, one commentator said of Christian obedience this, 
Quote, obedience does not produce a believer in Jesus Christ, but true belief will always produce obedience in a believer of Jesus Christ. So here's the point, my friends. A believer is motivated to obey God because, as the Apostle Paul said, God is the one who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. You see, a believer's obedience is a special kind of obedience. Uh, as Joe Rigney put in his article uh, for DesiringGod.com in his response to this particular text, Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13, he said, quote, Christian obedience involves a miraculous and mysterious union of divine action and human action. And we see here in this text that we're looking at today that a believer's obedience is made manifest as they are not conformed to the passions, another way of saying passions, lusts, of your former ignorance, verse 14. We return to the Apostle Paul, and he chimes in, and this time in his letter to the Roman church. He said to the Roman church, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Romans 12, 1, 2. Do you get the idea here? It has to do with the mind. It's interesting in our very experiential culture, especially in the church, it seems almost like we need to say, no, we don't need our mind, we need our experiences. Well, the biblical text doesn't tell us that. We need both, and it needs to be balanced. We look at the word here, for example, let's look at this word, I mean, Translated conformed, it means, quote, to assimilate or to be fashioned into something. And so the emphasis here helps us uh, understand that conformity does not begin with outward actions, but it has to do more with our attitudes and our character. Hence, again, as I repeat myself, the focus on the mind, where thoughts and purposes can be formed. As you read through the Apostle Peter's letter, you will discover the former attitudes and characters, character of the elite, uh, elite, pardon me, elect exiles prior to their salvation in Christ. For example, here in 14, we have ignorance. And the way the word is used here, it is sinful ignorance. After all, for what else could it result but in passions or lust? Moving to chapter 2, Peter said, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain, abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against you. Chapter 2, verse 11. He would go on to say, Instead, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. See, this is what we struggle against. We don't, we don't struggle against many things, but we struggle against three things. Three things that, are, that come at us in our thinking, especially the world, the devil, and our flesh, our sinful nature. We can go in Peter's letter to chapter 3, 4, and 5, where Peter describes the former ignorance of the elect exiles before God in his mercy through Jesus Christ caused us, he would say, to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. See, salvation does something because we are... Uh, uh, given the Holy Spirit, and one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is sanctification, that is to make us more and more like Jesus, or more and more holy. Um, so when we think of our current context, let's go back to our current context, 21st century Western world, uh, we have this attitude, this attitude is very prevalent of one of avoiding problems and pain. This kind of thinking says, uh, I don't deserve to experience trials and suffering. Apostle Peter, as we have seen in the text, exhorted that his audience not adopt that kind of thinking, that attitude. As, that, as one that is born again or spiritually a new creation in Christ, the believer is to conform to the examples that Jesus gave us. And the Old Testament and New Testament is clear that Christ is God's suffering servant. We see that, in, and especially in Isaiah. Jesus even said, you follow me, I suffer, you suffer, to paraphrase. So, so this leaves us with another question. For a believer, what is the alternative then to conformity? Well, verse 15 and 16. 
But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all you can conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Verse 15, 16. Here the Apostle Peter answers that question we began with at the very beginning of our time. The question that we were challenged with, how are believers to live a God-centered life in the world today? The alternative then, according to Peter, according to the Bible as a whole, the alternative to conformity is holiness. Now, my next comments are going to be um, really formed from, pardon me, one of my commentaries, the Holman New Testament commentary. I just want to give credit to that. So let's continue. You know, when we think of God's characteristics that he has revealed to you and me, the most significant must be and should be his holiness. The Old Testament and the New Testament speak more about God's holiness than any other attribute of God. So what does this mean for a believer uh, who possesses a living hope? According to verse 3 here. Well, it means that a believer is, is to nurture personal holiness. The Apostle Peter put it this way, be holy, verse 15. The Greek verb translated here is be, is a is an imperative, a command. Be holy. My friends, the believers to nurture personal holiness in what? In all of your conduct, or in all your conduct, verse 15. The writer to the Hebrews put it this way, strive for peace with everyone and for holiness without which, holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 4. Apostle Paul put it this way, since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. So again, my friends, the, the alternative conformity, conforming to our culture and all its falseness, is holiness, which includes this sense, this moral sense of separation from evil, alongside a life that you and I live dedicated to living right, to living a righteous life. This is not easy. It means we have to work at setting aside, pushing away, fighting against our sinful nature, against demonic influence, and against the world's message, which is anti-God. It's, it's not something that we can do passively. It's something we need to do actively. And the great news is that God has given us his word. God has given us the ordinances of the churches, of the church, communion and baptism. God has given us his spirit. God has given us everything that we need to stand firm, as, he's, as uh, Paul says in Ephesians, to stand firm against all that that comes against us. And it's God that does all of it in the first place. So how are believers to live a God-centered life in the world today? Well, their attitudes, your attitude, my attitude, our lives should be different because of our relationship to God through Jesus Christ. This is a life lived from, this is a life lived from the inside out. A life that is empowered and led by the Holy Spirit, which produces a holiness in our lives that conforms to God's commands which in turn produces this amazing thing, the character of God himself in each believer. Because God said, my friends, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Let us pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the encouragement of Peter's letter, even into our day today, so practical. Um, we, we struggle, we have trouble, we have trials, we have a variety of them. Could be from family, friends, could be from workplaces, could be even persecution for our faith in your son, Jesus Christ. It could be from so many different areas. Life is guaranteed to bring us trials. But here's the hope that we have, a living hope, a living hope that God, you have given us through our salvation and, and our faith and trust in your son, Jesus Christ. So with all this in mind, I pray for my friends. I thank you for each one, and I pray if there's a need in their life, whether it be financial, physical, Whatever it is, Lord, whatever trial, or tribulation, or struggle, or 
whatever it is, Lord. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would be there with them, as you promised you would, that you would be sustaining them, that you also have their front, their back, their top, their bottom, and their sides, and that you will see them through it. Why? For the glory of your name, and for the amazing, amazing, amazing time that we will find when Jesus returns. Thank you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, folks. God bless. Shalom.